Our speaker today is Dr. Dante L. Adurada. Dr. Adurada is currently a research fellow for summer crop pathology at the University of Southern Queensland, Australia. He conducts research on protecting crops and pasture against pests, uh, diseases, and weeds. He is particularly interested in disease resistance, diagnostics, mycology, bacteriology, rice breeding, and plant pathology. And prior to occupying his position at the USQ, he served in the uh, NSW Department of Primary Industries, then at the NSW Department of Industry. And before moving to Australia, he was a scientist at the International Rice Research Institute, specializing in abiotic stress, rice breeding for nearly a decade. Dr. Adorada earned his PhD in plant pathology in 2013 from Charles Sturt University at New South Wales, Australia. He garnered his MS in agricultural biology in 1994 at the New Mexico State University in the United States. Sir Dante took his BS in agriculture at the University of the Philippines here in Los Banos. So everybody, let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Dante L. Adorada. Sir Dante, you can take the floor, please. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Florante, for that introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Jennifer Niem uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. Actually, I was pretty hesitant because she was asking me to present something on um, the biodiversity. And then I realized like, oh, I've got something from my uh, previous research in my PhD that I could uh, present to you guys. So, so here it is. Um, so as the title says, um, it should be as for school, vaginis rice, not nice for Australian rice. So we're looking into origin and diversity. So the outline of, for the outline of my presentation, so I'll give you uh, some background on the importance of rice. Um, we all know that Philippines is a rice-based and rice-eating country, so probably you know exactly what I mean. Um, and then we'll talk about the rice industry in Australia. And we'll look into the importance of sheet brown rat disease in rice. And then we'll go on to how we went about in the identification and looking at the pathogenic and genetic diversity of this particular um, pathogenic organism. And then we look on where it originated. So why rice? Well, I mean, the Philippines is uh, a rice eating country. So you know exactly what I mean when I say it's really important. Uh, it's the main food source for two thirds of Earth's population. And it is the second highest worldwide production next to maize. Uh, it's the most important grain with regards to human nutrition. An average person eats 100 to 130 to 180 kilograms of rice per year. Average person in Asia eats rice two to three times a day, but I think that's not true for Filipinos. We usually eat rice like even on our snack. So I could say Filipinos eat five times a day uh, with rice. And three of the world's most populous nations are rice-based societies. That includes China, India, and Indonesia, uh, which comprise nearly 2.5 billion people. This might be not the correct figure because this figure was collected when I was still doing my PhD way back in 2009. So this might have been, might have rise already. So what do we use rice for? So besides a staple that we eat it every day, I mean, we could produce uh, paper out of rice. These are the rice products. We've got rice krispies that we use on, we eat on breakfast. And like the plant parts of rice can be used as uh, for handicrafts, like bags like this. J Japan is famous for sake, which is uh, a rice-based alcoholic beverage. Uh, rice also as well is used for brewing beer. We have rice bran oil and rice beauty products. So I don't know, I haven't used any of this yet. So I don't know what, uh, what it can do to us. Uh, Stephanie Rice is, uh, we just put it, 
put her there because of her last name. Stephanie Rice is a uh, an Olympic swimmer that uh, she won three Olympic gold medals. So we just putting her there because her, her last name is Rice. So where do we grow rice here in Australia? So most of the rice being grown in Australia is in the uh, where the Murrumbidgee River and the Murray River uh, merges, and that's on the southeastern part of New South Wales. So 85% of Australia's rice production is being grown here in this area. And most of the rice being grown here are the medium grain uh, and the Japonica type, which is the ones being used by Japanese and Korean for make, uh, making those sticky rice cakes and what they usually use for making sushi. 15% of rice production is uh, made up in the in northern Queensland, which is basically tropical rice or more the more irrigated rice. So, eighty-five percent to ninety percent of Australia's grain produced are being exported, and only fifty percent are being consumed domestically. So, what are the different rice pests and diseases? So, in the tropics, well, I came from Erie and I worked for Erie for ten years and field rice for close to five years, and being a, 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 a rice pathology. So he listed 26 different rice insect pests, 24 rice diseases, 16 weed species, birds and rats that are of economic importance. In Australia, the most common disease is sheath blight caused by a fungus, which is uh, rice octania solanae. Stock borer, blood worms, army worms, and leaf miners are common insect pests. Weeds are also a serious problem. And rodents and birds are problematic as well as they feed on rice grains before they are harvested. So in 2005, in the Murumbiji irrigation area in Lytton, that's here is where they do their rice breeding and rice production. Uh, Cother and his colleagues observed this disease on rice, on this disease on these rice growing areas in Lytton. And later in 2009, they reported it as a pathogen that causes uh, sheath brown rice, sheath brown rot, uh, sheath discoloration, and um, causing infertility on rice. And they found it to be a clear and present danger to Australia's uh, rice production. So the disease was uh, identified to be caused by Pseudomonas fuscovaginae. It's a bacterium and it causes bacterial seed brown rot. Uh, there's no reported effect on humans and an average of 1% to 5% yield loss due to sterility and discolored grains. So they, a, there was a field trial that was done in Madagascar and uh, it reached to about 100% uh, yield loss. Just as mentioned, uh, the major disease of rice in, in Australia is caused by sheath rot. Uh, sorry, it's sheath blight. The symptom of sheath brown rot can be mistaken to be a disease caused by Rhizoctonia solanae, which is sheath blight, and also sheath rot caused by the fungus Sarocladium oryzae. But these two organisms can easily be uh, diagnosed because they produce uh, mycelial, uh, fungal structures such as mycelia and sclerotial bodies. And so it could easily be diagnosed. Uh, the disease caused by this bacteria is, is widely distributed in rice growing areas around the world. So as you can see, it was identified as well in the Philippines. So it's also infects a wide variety of hosts, mostly those belonging to the grass family, which is the Puwasi. So it could infect um, 
summer crops such as sorghum, winter crops such as triticum or wheat, summer crops such as maize, and you've got um, grasses as well. So the first thing that we did is to do bacterial isolation. And just so we started collecting, we went back to that area in the Yanko region just to collect samples from their breeding plots and their production plots. And from there, we, uh, we were able to isolate 19 samples. East Timor being near a, ne a neighboring country of Australia, and we thought of it as a just a stole throw away from Australia, we, we got the opportunity to travel to East Timor and also do, do some sampling and collect samples or bacteria in, in East Timor. Interestingly, the only way to get to that area, which is a highland in East Timor is by taking the danger bus. Fortunately, we, were a, we, we just uh, hired a vehicle so we didn't have to uh, ride the danger bus. But then when we got into East Timor, we were then booked into the hotel risky. So everything seems to be in danger in there. And from there, we started collecting um, samples from the different rice products in, uh, through the cooperation of uh, scientists there and, and community representatives. So East Timor being a marginal country, they don't really have established uh, laboratory to do that. So here I am inside my room in Hotel Risky doing bacterial isolation. And, and with the strict biosecurity laws in Australia, we won't be able to bring in live bacterial uh, cultures back in Australia. So the way we did it is we use FTA cards. So FTA card is, it has chemicals in it that when you put uh, bacterial cells, it will uh, readily degrade the cell walls and release the DNA. So what we're actually bringing back in Australia using FDA cards are bacterial uh, cells and bacterial DNA. So there's no problem in terms of quarantine and uh, biosecurity. So from East Timor, we were able to collect 35 bacterial isolates. So in total, we were able to uh, collect 106 bacterial uh, um, cultures. So some type cultures that we requested well, when we when uh, arrived in uh, at Charleston University where they already have type cultures in, in storage in the minus uh, 80 freezer. So, so, so this is how many I work on in terms of pseudomonas, well, in terms of bacteria that I need to identify. In, in terms of identification, we did, we did the polyphasic identification. So polyphasic meaning several stages or several phases of identification. In this case, I, for phenotyping, I used the BAC ID. So BAC ID is a, a system that was developed for resource poor plant pathology laboratories or those marginal countries that don't, that don't have the equipments and the capacity to identify uh, using expensive and uh, complicated machineries. This back ID system uses morphology, biochemical tests, and metabolic activity. So I think nowadays, most people are using the biolog, which is like a, a compact, uh, collection of all these tests. So another thing is way of, another phase of the identification is using a PCR-based molecular method, which is the genotyping. So we'll go through these uh, different steps one at a time as we proceed with this uh, presentation. So with back ID, the first thing is that we isolated all the different bacteria and look into the morphology on uh, different media. So this is showing now 
what they look like on nutrient agar medium. So we look on the color, the uh, elevation, the edges, the shape. And then uh, the next thing is, which is a, a very basic uh, microbiological test, which is gram staining. So it's basically separating the uh, gram positive and the gram negative by staining. Uh, Fuscovalgine is a gram negative, uh, same as most of, as all of the uh, Pseudomonas species. The next thing is the using the King's B medium uh, fluorescence test. So all of the isolates, we grow it on King's B medium and put it under UV illumination, and then, then we'll see which ones fluoresce. And Pseudomonas fuscovagine, it fluoresce under uh, KB medium. So it's, it's a process of elimination. We just, as we proceed, we just keep those that we think are pseudofuscobagenate based on the different tests. We also have an oxidase test production. So should monosfuscobagenate is positive for oxidase, oxidase production. So these are strips that are commercially available. And all you need to do is just dip this uh, strip oxidase strip on the, a colony of bacteria and it will produce different colors. So it's more color, colorimetric. The one that produces blue is positive for oxidase. Another thing that uh, we've done is the, the nit nitrate uh, reduction test. So again, this is, this is a media that you just grow the different uh, <clears throat> bacteria. And for this test, Fuscovagine is negative for nitrate reduction. Tetrazodium chloride tolerance. Uh, Fuscovagine is positive for this test. Uh, for the oxidation fermentation of carbohydrate test, uh, Pseudomonas fuscovagine is positive for oxidation and negative for fermentation. So what will happen is that based on those different tests, we could group the different bacteria that we have, all those 109, 109 bacteria that we've tested, and then we could group them. And so we'll proceed with that one uh, when we put those, those information on the back. There's a, a software for back ID where you plug in all those uh, information, positive, negative, and everything. And then you'll come up with a, an identity based on those um, criteria. So the next um, identification method we've used is the PCR-based identification. So this is more on the gene level. So if, if you guys have seen Jurassic Park 1, they explain how PCR works and how they took out a piece of DNA from a frog and inserted it. So, Basically, that's how PCR is. It's more um, gene-based or DNA-based. Um, 16S is a, is a universal primer which is being used for identification of bacteria. So what we did is we subjected all these uh, bacteria into the six in, in amplifying the, their 16S uh, region. And we've done it for all the uh, suspected pseudomonas and all the other bacteria that we've collected. Another primer that we've used for identification is the RPOB uh, for the RPOB gene. So basically for identification, we've used 16S and RPOB gene. So what we've done is run the PCR, get the amplicon, purify it or clean it, and then when we send it out for sequencing. So back then during that time, we don't have a sequencer in our laboratory. So we have to send it to a uh, sequencing provider company, which is AGRF uh, based in Melbourne. So after that, do we, uh, this sequencing uh, service provider will send us their uh, results and they usually have like an initial identification. So what happened is they sequence it and then they run it again, uh, their, their data bank compared with all the sequences present in 
GenBank, and then they'll give us the similar uh, the identity of those individual bacteria with corresponding similarity values. So as you can see, the sample number one uh, resulted to 99% fruscovaginate. Some of them resulted to different uh, organism. So that's the beauty of doing polyphasic identification because apart from uh, the genotyping, uh, results, we could also, we will use as well the uh, back ID results and then we'll come up with a consensus of the identity of the uh, bacteria. So here, I don't know if you could see it's so small. So here is now the summary of the identity of the uh, bacteria that we've been uh, studying. So we've got uh, the species based on the back ID and the 16S sequencing, the RPOB. So from here, we've selected representative uh, of the different pseudomonas that will then be used for the next stage, which is uh, looking into genetic diversity. So from the bacteria that we've isolated in East Timor, even though the pseudomonas is regarded as the usual suspect for this uh, disease on rice in East Timor. And we look on the plant and its seedborne identity. Unfortunately, we weren't able to find any pseudofuscovagine in East Timor. So that's good for them, but bad for me because I don't have enough samples to work on. So now looking into genetic diversity, now that we've already identified the, uh, the different bacteria, we now go into the use of, so for my uh, project, I've used the rep PCR geno genomic fingerprinting. So these are repetitive elements, which are uh, repeatedly present along the genome of the bacteria. I've used three different uh, primers, uh, the rep PCR, the box PCR, and the ERIC PCR. I've also used uh, a restriction digest of the 16S to 23S uh, intergenic spacer. So what you'll see, here is an example of a rep PCR. So what you'll see are polymorphic uh, fragments, uh, which will differentiate the different bacteria from each other. Um, so these are, the first uh, column is the size marker, and these ones are the different fragments amplified by the, uh, the rep uh, PCR markers. So we use, I, we've used Alpha is it's a uh, computer program that, uh, that will give you the size of the different fragments amplified using the different uh, primers. So that's for rep PCR, the same thing with box PCR. So we just get the score of all of this. So we come up with different sizes of fragments for the different bacteria. So that's Eric PCR. And for the restriction digest, so uh, the bacteria has restriction sites wherein it will, uh, it will cleave the, um, the DNA fragment into different sizes. So I abuse, uh, how many was that? Two, three, I abuse seven of these uh, restriction enzymes to come up of, with different uh, DNA fragments to be used for my analysis. So what we we'll get from this, uh, using these markers and restriction uh, fragments are presence or absence of the different size of fragments on the genome of the, uh, the, the, uh, of the uh, bacteria, the pseudomonas. So it's basically, its presence or absence, which you are scored as one or zero. So from this binary score, so this is just a matrix of the binary scores of all those fragments. 
will come up with a similarity matrix based on dice coefficient and hierarchical clustering analysis by UPGMA. So I believe most of you have use of this. Uh, and then using a past software, a paleontological software, statistic software, we've come up with a, uh, a dendrogram or a cluster analysis. So basically those which have the same uh, fragment sizes will uh, cluster together. The next thing that we've done is looking now into the pathogen, uh, pathogenic diversity or aggressive, aggressiveness of the uh, bacteria. The, for the sake of those who are not plant, uh, um, who are not uh, working on uh, plant pathogens, when you say pathogenicity, this one refers to the ability of on, an organism to cause disease or its ability to harm the host, meaning it's just a positive or negative. It's, can it infect or not? It's just a yes or no. Aggressiveness is the quantitative component of pathogenicity. So this is how you measure the degree of infection caused by the bacteria. Uh, in most papers, we, we interchangeably use virulence uh, with aggressiveness but virulence is defined as the relative capacity of a microorganism to overcome the body defenses of the host. So this one is basically addressing the resistance of the host. So not necessarily, uh, well, it, just like what I said, this is uh, interchangeably being used with aggressiveness. So a, a virulent pathogen would be aggressive. So when we did the uh, pathogenic diversity, so we had to inoculate the, the bacteria that we've identified. And we, I've looked into different methods of inoculation. I've looked into spraying, spraying with the uh, uh, abrasives and uh, using the pinprick method. So this, for those who are interested on uh, the different uh, methods that I've used, it's published on this paper, but from that result, I've selected the pinprick method because basically the pinprick method really uh, introduced the, uh, the, the bacteria into the plant and it's easily uh, measured because you're just gonna be focusing on a single uh, area to measure the degree of aggressiveness of the, uh, the bacteria. So the results of this have shown that among these bacteria that uh, these are representative of the many bacteria that I've uh, evaluated or that I've screened and identified. We just resorted to using representatives due to limitation in time and in budget, because this is just part of a PhD thesis. So from here, we could see that the more, the most aggressive uh, bacteria or Pseudomonas fuscovaginae isolates are those coming from Australia and it's uh, comparable to the one from Madagascar. So take note where the Japanese isolates are because later on, we will be comparing the, the molecular diversity with the molecular, uh, with the diversity in terms of aggressiveness. So now that we know uh, which ones are, are more virulent, we now wanted to know where Australian isolates uh, group in terms of uh, based on the DNA or the uh, on genotyping. So Australia clustered together in this group and at less than 60% similarity, it's close to the Japanese isolate, which is not surprising because the first, well, rice was introduced in Australia by a Japanese. 
sorry, I cannot, some, something's covering my, anyway, sorry, going back. So we, here we could say that it's more closely related to the Japanese uh, isolates, but in terms of aggressiveness, it's not really correlated to uh, the genotyping doesn't correlate with the uh, aggressiveness diversity. A, so in summary, uh, the strains of Pseudomonas vaginae found in Australia are more aggressive compared to world strains. Cluster analysis revealed diversity among strains and distinguished strains by origin. Genetic diversity did not correlate with aggressiveness of strains indicating independence in both trends of diversity. Origin of the strains did not correlate with pathogenicity and aggressiveness of strains. And strains for new, from New South Wales, Australia and Japan clustered together possibly indicating common lineage. However, due to the limited number of strains, uh, this conclusion is still inconclusive. We still need to get more isolates. I just don't know how many isolates will is sufficient enough to really come up with the conclusion on the diversity and the aggressive, aggressiveness of this uh, particular bacteria. It was recommended by two of the reviewers of my paper. That's the reason why my diversity paper and aggressiveness paper wasn't accepted due to the limited number of isolates. So, and that was the plan after this uh, particular research. But the thing is that ACR did not provide any more funding to continue the work. However, there is a person who continued the work, but on a different area, looking into uh, quorum sensing of pseudomonas. And there have been two publications already by Patel, and I forgot the name of the other person who did a, uh, a whole genome sequencing of pseudomonas. Um, one of my co-supervisors is in the process now of publishing the genome sequencing, genome sequence of the Australian strain. So hopefully this information will be uh, useful now for the current people working on this. And currently I have a student, a PhD student from Papua New Guinea, who's working on looking into a uh, complex bacteria causing discoloration of rice grains, but he's focusing more on uh, rice being grown in the tropical areas of uh, Queensland. So this particular uh, project was, uh, so I would like to thank my uh, supervisors, Professor Gabinas, Dr. Benjamin Stoddart and Dr. Cassiana Veracruz from ERI for the assistance and guidance in uh, wrapping up this research. And this, uh, I, I got financial support from the CSU scholarships, uh, ACR, ERI, and the Graham Center. And I would like to take this opportunity as well to inform everyone that uh, USQ is uh, providing is offering annual scholarship for PhD. So if there's anyone who's interested in uh, venturing into plant pathology on summer crops and winter crops, uh, check out this link. And I also have a uh, YouTube uh, video that will tell you, that provides tips in getting scholarships for postgraduate study in the USA and Australia. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and, oh, sorry, again, uh, this project was funded by the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research, CSU, ERI, and you could see, uh, here's my email address, my phone number, and you could check us out on our CCH uh, Twitter account and Facebook, Facebook, Facebook account. And again, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give a presentation and for your attention. So, 
anyone who wants to shoot the first question. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Dante. It was a very interesting presentation. Nakatuwa yung mga, ano nyo ah, mga memes. <laughs> oh, well, you see, when I was in, 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 in the US, I was by myself for, the, for three years. And the, the thing that keep me sane is just watching movies. So <laughs> that's the reason why you, you yes. see lots of posters of movies in there because I think I've seen most of the movies. Yeah, okay. So anyone who wants to, you know, uh, shoot the first question. Um, Take your number. Take <laughs> uh, your number. We have lots of time. We have, uh, uh, we have lots of time to spare. Okay. Um, probably ako. I'll, I'll, I'll give a... A very simple question, na lang muna, sir. Uh, yes. I'll leave the the high tech ones to the 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 geneticists and the pathologists out there. Yes. Um, I've read that uh, uh, P. Fusco Vagine uh, was first describing Japan, right? And uh, yes. it it came from the cold and the humid tropical highlands. So, yep. Yep. So, my relation ba yung it's like uh, where, where it was originally described, it was it was high, it was humid, and it it was very wet. Um, yeah. Have you observed it's the same also with regards to the occurrence in Australia? Oh yes, yes. Uh, New South Wales is compared. New South Wales is uh, more of a tropical tropical as a tropical environment. We get winter in here, mm -hmm. unlike Queensland where they grow tropical rice. So that's the reason why Japonica rice was introduced in Lytton. So it gets uh, pretty cold in there uh, some months of the year. Um, actually, I forgot to mention, in the Philippines, the Pseudophos bubagine was um, described on a disease in one of the highlands in the Philippines, and the growers refer to them as Ratek, Ratek. Uh, the one that work on the different uh, seed discoloration bacteria in the Philippines uh, isolated a bacteria in Sinaloan. So I think there are high areas in Sinaloan that they grow rice, probably in upland. Yeah. So, yeah. And batas din ang rainfall sa, yeah. sa southern so, part of uh, Laguna. Yeah. So the, the disease are very... Um, aggressive at temperatures between 25 to 28 degrees centigrade, mm -hmm. and it will not grow at 37 degrees centigrade or above. Okay, so we do not expect them during the uh, dry season. Yes, uh, and the thing as well- In the Philippines. In the Philippines and even in here. So mm -hmm. we call Fusco vagine as a disease that occurs every five or 10 years. I see. Okay. The thing is, uh, we need to be ready with this. There are diseases here in Australia also, which is, which of course, uh, every five or 10 years. But when that time comes, then we'll be like, what are we going to do? Because we haven't done anything about it. So it's more proactive just to start working on it and by the time the problem comes in we're already ready and we know what to do okay um mr jonathan jaime guerrero from beagle university asks um he's curious whether uh, fusco vagine uh can cause or does it cause the disease alone or are there pathogens that act synergist synergistically to cause the disease so and what is the management measure employed to control such disease? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I already mentioned in, uh, in the later part of my talk that uh, we need more information in this. We need more isolates. And we, we, I actually proposed a postdoc uh, research on the comp the, comp, uh, the disease complex caused by bacteria and other bacteria. So when I've uh, done the isolation and identification, apart from uh, Pseudomonas foscovaginae, there are also other Pseudomonas species that are, were identified. There were Isidoborax, there's Pantuia, 
there's uh, Santo Monas. And still we don't know whether a full blown uh, symptom is caused just by the Pseudomonas poscovaginae alone or a complex of the other organism. That's the reason why, uh, just like what I said, I have a student from Papua New Guinea who's looking into the uh, a bacterial disease complex from the different bacteria isolated on uh, rice discoloration. Did I answer the question or there, was there a follow-up question? Uh, what are the management measures employed to control the disease? There is a, uh, a bactericide that was proven effective and it was tested by the then Director General of Erie during his time when he was still doing his, when he was still uh, not the dire Director General of Erie, one of his research in the US. Uh, I forgot the name of the bactericide, but it's not uh, registered for use in Australia. So yeah, sanitation is one of the management uh, because bacteria, this bacteria has other alternate hosts and if the alternate hosts are present, it could be transferred on your crop. And also uh, strict biosecurity measure or strict uh, seed health testing because this, this bacteria is seed borne. So germplasm exchange, especially now that uh, the different uh, rice research, like uh, the China Rice Research Institute, the uh, Philippine Rice Research Institute, the uh, India. So there are like different rice research institutes that exchanges germplasm. So there should be strict implementation on seed health testing on each of these um, institute. So any more questions? Um, sir, um, since you mentioned that the disease is seed borne, is it possible to, you know, uh, to have contamination uh, during post harvest? Like, especially when you know you use different kinds of machine to harvest like you're harvesting sorghum and you're harvesting rice there uh would would it be possible for cross contamination of this uh bacterium from an alternative host to to rice uh were you asking when using the same machine for yes yes if, processing? if. Mm -hmm. yeah well the the bacteria is transferred out in the field by uh, water splashes. So the, the medium to transfer the bacteria is water. Water. So if the, for example, the rice is contaminated, but uh, you know, the machinery, machinery is dry. So um, I think there's no risk of uh, there's cross -contamination. No risk. Uh, Yeah, because if, if it's dry, I mean, it just stays inside and it won't come out. So I, I, I also have, uh, there's another uh, paper that I published looking into the endoplytic ability of this pathogen wherein it just it stays inside the plant and when the right times come, mm -hmm. that's when it uh, produces the symptom. So it goes from the seed into the plant. So again, the cross-contamination, I think it's facilitated by the presence of water. So if you, if you soak, uh, say you have a few infected uh, seeds, you soak it in water, which is the usual uh, uh, method of us when pre-germinating rice, when we do the dapong method and we, yes. we do the uh, uh, wet bed method. So we soak it first. And if you have a few seeds which have seed-borne seed -borne bacteria and you mix it with the healthy one, you are going to be spreading the disease or the bacteria to the other seeds. Uh, any more uh, questions pa? Okay, um, I think uh, yung, um, you've mentioned earlier that uh, uh, it was a hypothesis that uh, this uh, 
bacteria entered uh, Australia through East Timor. So, um, what what do you think is uh, the you know the mode? Was it transported? Was it through like uh, through the market? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, you, you probably you got me wrong. Okay, mm. the the disease was uh, the uh, hypothesis that the the uh, bacteria or food pseudomonas cuscovagini entered the uh, Australia when the Japanese first introduced. Ah, I see. Okay. East Timor because it's just near a neighboring country of Australia. That's the reason why we went to East Timor and did sampling and isolated whatever is causing a what looks like a, a sheath brown rot or mm -hmm. seed discoloration but then we didn't find any fusco so that just simply explains like it's not only fusco that's causing those uh, sheet brown rot looking symptom and seed discoloration and rice there are other bacteria that might be causing it not just through the monad, which is a follow-up to the question like, is there any other bacteria that causes syner synergistically to produce the symptom? Mm -hmm. So we're still looking into that, provided that we have the money, because just like what I said, we the the, the research on this was tough, but it the, the research is continuous. We have people from Italy. John Leach from uh, Colorado State University is working on this one. Uh, Erie is working on this one. So there's been continuous work, but right now I'm not really updated with what's going on. But there could be a possibility of a disease complex, which is what my student is working on at the moment, the guy from PNG. Okay. A uh, question from Maria Luisa Oropesa. Um... I sis. <laughs> She's been living in Melbourne for 21 years now, and she doesn't even know that uh, that rice is grown here. <laughs> so yeah. any, of, any of this rice being produced locally sold in the in the local market. So well, we have the, been the rice... eating jasmine rice from Thailand. Maybe time to eat locally produced rice. That's uh, uh, just like what I said. I mean, well, rice is uh, basically uh, being run by Sunrise. That. S U N R I C E company. So anything, any rice produced in Australia is uh, managed by this company. And the rice production is concentrated in Southeast New South Wales along the Murumbiji and Murray River. That's in Lytton. Uh, it's in Yanko uh, in Lytton. So that's where, where the bulk of the production is for 85% of. Australia's rice production. And going back, 15% is being grown in uh, Northern uh, Queensland. And 85% of the produce is being exported. I'm a fan of jasmine rice. I mean, there are like basmati rice in here, uh, which, has, which are being uh, used by most uh, people from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh but I usually prefer jasmine rice, which originated from Thailand. I hope that answers your question, Ma'am uh, Ma Luisa. Okay. Yeah, oh, sunrise is, yeah, sunrise is the Australian uh, grown rice. So um, you mentioned earlier na parang may, uh, in, in the phytic nature, um, yep. yung, yung bacterium. So if yeah. it stays uh, within the the rice plants tissues um what are what are the stages so my stages above the rice growing uh, rice growing stages were in dun sila like lalabas or magpo-proliferate and uh, why do you think so it selects that 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 growing stage okay so when, when i meant endopathic so it will start with a seed born infected uh, seed. Mm -hmm. So the bacteria is inside the plant and endopithically meaning it's inside the plant. It could be epipithic. Well, it's basically a, an epipipe. It's outside and it's also inside the plant. So endopithically it's inside and it will stay there 
and it just stays on the vascular tissue of the rice plant and it will wait for the right moment, the right condition. The, basically, it's the, the right temperature mm. to produce the symptom. And when it produces the symptom, it goes up all the way into the grain. And then when you have strong winds that causes damage, when, when, when there's movement of the rice plant, it causes damage. See, bacteria can only enter the host tissue through natural openings and through wounds. Mm -hmm. So that's how it spread. Rain splashes and then like, so the, 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 uh, the canopy or uh, rubs each other and causes uh, wound so, and, and then the bacteria transfers. So that, that's, the, that's how the disease is spread in the field. And as well also, like if you have planted, all of the seeds that you planted have the seed-borne uh, pathogen in it. Um, curious lang ako, for example, in one seed lot, like, uh, you have uh, two sacks of uh, foundation seeds. Mm -hmm. And let's say, just curious, uh, what is probably the you know, minimum, okay. the minimum uh, percentage mm -hmm. of uh, uh, infection in one, in, for example, in the two kilograms of foundation seeds? that would enable the, the bacterium to spread and infect every plant? Okay, that's a good question. And that's something that I'm curious as well, because I never got the chance to do that. So I also propose a research on initial seed lot infection mm -hmm. and how much it would, I actually started working on that. And I, I, I have a, if you, if you look on that, uh, standard screening methodology that I've used. I have a seedling, um, seedling method of inoculation there where I soak the seeds and then it produce uh, a, an infection on the plant. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily the, the, uh, the typical symptom, but it retards the growth of the seedlings in the presence of bacteria. So, to answer your question, I don't have any idea on the minimum amount of inoculum present in, in a bag of uh, rice that you'll be using for, uh, for, for propagating. Yes, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, from Yolanda Angeles, so her question is, if this disease is already present in the Philippines, and uh, so what region was it first observed? Uh, do you know if it's already you know, you know I think it's it all was, over in the Philippines? It's uh, the disease. It was this was just told to me verbally by uh, uh, Doctor Cassiana Vera Cruz, and there was it was it wasn't published. She just told me that the disease was uh, discovered somewhere in the Visayan region. And that's where they called the growers called it Ratek Ratek. And the one that they isolated and was worked on by Bart Cotin, the guy who worked extensively on uh, seedborne diseases of rice, he found one, an isolate from Siniloan. Okay. At the moment, uh, just like what I said, it's, it's, it's more temperature dependent. And I don't think we're getting that temperature in the Philippines. And we don't have that many exchange of probably rice varieties there to spread the disease. So in terms of risk, we just find this disease as posing risk, but it's not economically important at the moment in the Philippines probably in another country, in other countries, but not yet in the Philippines. Probably in Japan, where it's more temperate and it's more favorable for the disease. So anything which uh, whose wet or uh, temperature doesn't go 37 degrees and above, it could be a problem. So from 
uh, Jen, Jennifer Niem. So being a seed born pathogen, can the can we use uh, seed treatment to protect the rice from this disease? Yes, and I don't know about the Philippines if they uh, just like what I said, uh, lots of chemicals, especially bactericide, are not allowed to be used in Australia. As far as in the Philippines, I don't know if this is already registered. There's a bactericide. So just to um, preemptively control what's on the, on the seed, you could do seed treatment. It just depends on whether it's registered for use or not. Because so, bactericide is a very, very controlled uh, treatment, a very controlled chemical. So if you're talking about a chemical control, um, for example, if we use antibiotics or you know, bactericides, uh, you'll be administering it during um, like inoculating it uh, at when, when there are still seeds or uh, it's still like seeds. spray? Okay, now it, it, I remember now, it's called the, the bactericide is uh, casugamycin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the bacterial name. And if those who are interested on what the bacteria is, just email me and uh, provide you the reference to that. But so far, it's not being used in it. Uh, sorry, going back to your question, Florante. Uh, answer, uh, how is it administered? Uh, seed uh, for that, for that uh, seed treatment, okay. So if it's seed, um, would, it, would, would, the, would that compound be, you know, uh, absorbed by the rice and then later on stored it by the rice plant and transported to the grain during reproduction stage um, would it would there be a possibility that it could be you know eventually stored in human in yeah, human bodies yeah, yeah. during so, consumption so, um, well just i haven't done any work on that bacteria side because i get, uh, just like what i said it's not allowed to be used in here mm -hmm. so i don't know how long it persists in the seed and will it be transported or how long it will last inside the plant. Uh, I'm more, I'm a proponent of disease resistance. Mm -hmm. So basically my research is geared towards molecular, uh, uh, molecular breeding for resistance. So I, I haven't done any tests on chemicals. I've done uh, hot water treatment. Mm -hmm. Hot water treatment is basically used by for seed health testing, uh, especially for uh, germplasm exchanges. The problem with hot water, well, hot water treatment can kill whatever is inside. The problem with that is it reduces the uh, viability of the seeds. So some seed. countries, including India, when they request seeds, when I was still in Erie, they don't want their seeds to be uh, treated with hot water because when it gets in there, they don't usually get uh, seeds that germinate. Thank you, sir. Uh, from Carol Amper, uh, she's interested to know if this pathogen can infect upland rice varieties, probably Philippine varieties. Upland yes, rice. the yeah. answer is yes. Yeah, be, uh, especially upland rice where it's elevated and it has the a much lower temperature compared to the lowland area so definitely the upland rice is more um, it's a more conducive environment for uh, the bacteria to grow and cause infection okay, but but do you think sir na, uh, some of our traditional and heirloom uh, rice varieties have this natural um, this defense resistance, mechanism. defense mechanism. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why, uh, if you look at uh, most people now, most breeders now are going back into the heirloom and traditional varieties and even weeds, mm -hmm. because these these plants they have the resistance and tolerance traits or genes that you could be that you could incorporate on newer varieties. So the thing about Breeding for resistance is you need to give up something to gain something. You mm -hmm. cannot have a perfect plant. If you want disease, if you want high yield, 
probably you might knock off or silence some genes for resistance. Mm -hmm. So if you want highly resistance, you might knock off or silence the genes for uh, good grain quality or high yield. So I, I, for, the for the past 10 years that I've worked in Erie and five years at field rice, I never saw any rice which is perfect. <laughs> Not, the, nothing complete is perfect. package. <laughs> yeah, there's no complete package. You might need to give up something. Okay. So from Mary Lou Cambronero, um, I think this one is, has, has been partially answered, but probably mm -hmm. you could elucidate. Can this disease in rice be a threat to the economy? Oh, just like what I said, it depends on... on uh, I, I've never... The, the only report of 100% yield loss was in the one in when was that the one in Africa, but it was just a, a a controlled field trial. It's not it's not the farmers' field that they've uh, measured mm -hmm. the yield loss, but it causes seed discoloration, and when you uh, export or sell your produce, there's a measure of grain quality so it needs to be clean mm -hmm. and if has if it has seed discoloration then the quality of your produce will go down so countries which has uh threatened by this disease will will yes for sure it has economic importance it will economically affect especially those uh rice dependent uh countries those countries that are dependent in growing rice for export. Uh, curious, lang, sir. Um, if it's if it causes uh, grain discoloration, yep. Um, so it's just uh, di lang siya white or baka mayroong brownish brownish siya color. But does it affect the nutritional quality and the uh, you know nutritional quality, cooking quality, the taste? No, the, the, the bacteria is superficial. It mm -hmm. just infects the hull. So the hull is uh, uh, discolored instead of like the golden brown. Yes. It becomes uh, necrotic or like dark brown. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look enticing. It doesn't, doesn't look appetizing. It doesn't look good. But when you, you meal the rice, mm -hmm. it removes the hull and you just have uh, regular rice and it doesn't affect the quality. I mean, the, the rice itself for cooking and the taste, mm -hmm. no effect. So basically, uh, if, if, kung mangyari ito, if it uh, proliferates in uh, in areas like uh, you know, the uplands, sa atin, sa com yep. communities, I think uh, even if there's uh, this disease present, yep. um, people could still use the rice, right? In it, lang, it, the mindset it, is... <laughs> It will lessen the yield. Mm -hmm. It will have effect on yield. It affects uh, the marketability of the rice because mm -hmm. it doesn't look good. It's discolored. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not what you want. I mean, if you go out in the market to buy uh, a a caban of rice for you to meal your yourself, mm -hmm. if you look at it, it's like it, it's discolored. Are you gonna buy it? You'll think. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it needs uh, educating the people on. Uh, the effect of this is like the the grain quality. I'm talking about grain quality in terms of appearance, mm -hmm. not grain quality but in terms of taste or cooking uh, um, characteristics or some cooking trait. Uh, the the impact is on the physical attributes, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Will I buy it or not? I mean, if you're gonna be selling your harvest in upland for like three, five hectares. And when the, the, the trader sees that, oh, it's discolored and they don't mean something which doesn't look good, I will not buy it. Mm. Okay. So um, additional comment from Jen, but, it, but the bacterium affects productivity. Yep. If the bacteria infects at the early stage of rice growth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it affects, well, um, I could refer you to that uh, paper that I've done. It affects germination. 
So germination alone, you lose a certain percentage. So if you're if you have normally for a a, a dapog, you need half a caban for one hectare. So if you grow it, and if there's bacteria that will uh, affect the germination, you'll have only like what? Uh, half of the, those that will have uh, good growth. So you'll have less number of seedlings to plant. So that's, that's a loss already. So thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, from Claire Ramos, uh, has it been a serious problem of Australian rice lately? Is it, you know, uh, has climate change affected it in terms of virulence? Okay, hi, Sis, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so just uh, the, going back to my presentation, it was observed in 2005. It was characterized in 2009. So I did the research up until 2013. And when I did the sampling in 2009 to 2010, I didn't find many uh, isolate. It's th those times where we're talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. So I think climate change affected the presence, the incidence of this disease. And for the longest time, we haven't seen, as far as I know, it hasn't been reported because if, it, if it's causing a problem in Australia, we would have known it. But mm -hmm. ever since I started working on it up until I finished my degree and even up to now, because I'm, I'm, I'm following up research on disease, uh, research on rice diseases because I'm, I'm interested on it. But so far I haven't seen any a big impact in rice production caused by this disease. Basically, it's here in Australia, the, the one that impacts the most on rice production is moisture stress, moisture. lack of water. I, I believe you've heard about in the news of what had happened in Australia. We had the worst uh, drought, drought in New South Wales last year. We have the, the bushfires in Australia. So, it's the climate that's really, it's the environment. Going back to the disease triangle, we have the pathogen present out in the field. We have susceptible varieties. So far, we don't have any resistance to this one because nobody has done anything about it. Nobody has screened, except for my, the one I've done in Erie. And the environment is a very big factor. We, we, the drought we're experiencing in Australia in the last three to five years. And we haven't seen it because just like what I said, it doesn't grow on temperatures above 37 degrees. And here we usually get 37 up to 41 degrees during the growth season on, on rice. Normally rice is being grown here from October up until March. Right, so thank you, Ma'am Claire, for that uh, question. I think, um, are there any other Pahabol uh, questions for Sir Dante before we close our webinar? So, yeah. so, okay, I think there's none. So, maraming salamat, Sir Dante, for that um, nice presentation. Very interesting to know that, uh, you know, may problems then on rice pala sa... So Australia, I, mm -hmm. I never thought that the Australians eat rice actually. Yeah. And um, so with that, uh, let me just uh, I've uh, let me announce that to everyone that I have uh, already posted the link to the webinars uh, evaluation form. I've already posted it in the chat box. So please check your uh, chat box. I'll just post it. Again, just to be sure, and while it's there, and while you are you know, answering that form, let us uh, you know present a, a simple uh, certificate virtually to Dr. Dante Adorada for being us for being our speaker. 
Okay, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. So, uh, the Museum of Natural History uh, here at UP Los Banos uh, is giving you Sir Dante El Adorada this certificate of recognition for serving as our resource person during uh, our 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar Series uh, with your seminar entitled Sudamonas Puscovagine, it's rice, not rice for Australian rice, a look at origin and diversity uh, held today, March 4, uh, 9 to 10 a 10.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. So, and our, uh, the signature of our director here is affixed. So, maraming salamat Sir Dante for serving as our uh, resource person and we hope that you could be uh, you could uh, uh, be one of our speakers in the near future yeah and and when when are you gonna send the check as well <laughs> <laughs> sir, Balabit, sir it will be emailed to you yeah that's just good that the, the photo anyway i would i would like to to yes, announce sir. as well that i'll have another webinar mm -hmm. hosted by the institute of plant breeding mm -hmm. through uh mark balendres Yes, uh, okay. I mean, Jen knows it, so I don't know if you, you, you guys exchange uh, information yes. or something. So in that webinar, I'll be talking about integrated disease management tools for summer crops in northern Australia. So okay. I'll be talking about different tools that people use to uh, decide on what to apply and when to apply integrated disease management on their disease problem. Right. So Thank that's going to be on the 19th of March. 19th of March. So to everyone out there, uh, I think you should search for the Facebook account of uh, the Institute of Plant Breeding uh, Pathological uh, Laboratory, I guess. And uh, so that you could uh, find that link to the registration page. So a few reminders. The link has already been forward to, forwarded to the chat box. But if you are familiar with the Bitly, uh, you could go to bit.ly slash 2021-bss-aval. And we will accept responses only until 12 noon. Um, I'm, I'm going to explain why it's uh, the time frame is shorter. Because uh, experiment lang, because uh, for the past three webinars, we've seen that the evaluators are more than the participants <laughs> so uh we'll just check and um we invite you to go to our website mnh.uplb.edu.ph if you want to write us uh email us at mnh.uplb.edu.ph we are in facebook twitter uh youtube and instagram look for the handle uplb museum and we're also there at uh, Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. Reminder lang po that the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash UPLB Museum. So with that, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat.